few weeks ago, YouTube recommended me this video. I investigated the country where every drug is legal by Tyler Oliveira. Now, if you look in the background of that thumbnail, you can see a little Canadian flag. And that's strange because I happen to know for a fact that Canada has not made all drugs legal. And I know that because I live in Canada and I'm not allowed to do a lot of the drugs that I would like to do. What a strange title for a YouTube video, I thought to myself out loud. How did he come to the conclusion that Canada legalized all drugs? And how did that conclusion survive what he calls an investigation? I was nowhere near prepared for the rabbit hole this video sent me down. I went on a real journey. Observe the runtime of this video and compare that to the 14 minute video I am responding to. Turns out he's talking about Vancouver, a city within Canada, not a country. Seems like that is a pretty obvious oversight. Seems like an easy error to avoid. And more accurately, it does seem like he's talking about only a few streets in Vancouver that he walked around for a couple of afternoons. The natural question which arises is why not title the video I investigated the city where every drug is legal? And obviously, it's because he already had a video titled that about Portland, Oregon. So instead of coming up with a more accurate clickbait title, he just kind of calls Vancouver a country. I guess that's more shocking and clickable. Feels like that should tip people off about his journalistic accuracy, but I don't see people talking about that in the comment section, and I've scrolled for a very long time, and I feel like I'm losing my marbles. What, is he deleting comments that point this out? How is nobody talking about the fact that Vancouver is not a country? That's such a huge detail to get wrong right up front. I did what I usually do in these situations. I put this video in my little document of videos to respond to eventually, because I'm a little content goblin. I got a horde bad video to talk about, and I knew it was gonna be pretty bad. Look at this fucking thumbnail. Warning, all drugs are legal. Who put that sign up? Like, nobody did. I'm, I'm not a moron. I, I realize it's a Photoshop. In the fiction this thumbnail is presenting, who put that sign there? The government? This video, and Tyler's content in general, is some of the most sickening stuff I've ever seen on YouTube. Some of the most sickening propaganda I've seen, period. And I've read the Turner Diaries for this channel. I'm not easily shocked. So who is Tyler Oliveira? He styles himself a YouTuber turned investigative journalist, which is strange for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that he's still clearly a YouTuber. His alleged investigative journalism still takes place on YouTube. In the past, he mostly did silly challenge videos, draining a pool with paper towels, surviving the ocean for a week, flying across America on a Charizard, that kind of stuff. Basic Mr. Beast wannabe shit, which Makes sense, because Tyler's big break was appearing in some Mr. Beast videos, but last February, his content took a dramatic shift into serious big boy journalism. He's investigated all sorts of hard-hitting topics, such as an underground city of mole people, Area 51, whether or not America did 9-11, and a whole lot of videos about places where there are a lot of homeless people, criminals, or drug users. And he does it with about as much tact as you'd expect from the man who executive produced Big Chungus the Game. Look at this shit. I investigated the city of real-life zombies. I don't think he did, journalistically speaking. I don't think that's what happened. Spoiler, he's talking about drug users. When he says real-life zombies, he means drug users. I don't need to tell you that he's dehumanizing drug users here, because here he is, literally saying they are not human. Also, you might notice a pattern with all of the stock photos that Tyler uses in his thumbnails of criminals. See if you can figure out the pattern. Tyler defends making videos about drug users and homeless people and other vulnerable people by saying that you'd have to be a real dum-dum to think this kind of content is something he's doing for money. He knows so much about YouTube he could make money doing anything, even, in his words, meaningless non-educational drivel that he has done and still does on occasion. Look, if I was just interested in making money, I'd just make useless garbage, which I only do sometimes. And that is a strange claim for him to make because if we go ahead and sort his content by most popular, Three out of ten of his most viewed videos are about homeless people and drug users, and those are the only videos among that top ten that are less than a year old. They do seem to be his most popular content. So, so then, um, hey, uh, how come, having done so many different kinds of videos with all sorts of different Pokémon, why is it that someone with your knowledge of YouTube, who could cover anything, find yourself in such a position where your most popular videos are on this supposedly difficult to profit off of topic. It does actually kind of seem like that's the easiest way to generate revenue on YouTube, dog. For you, anyway. 
because you, you seem to have tried everything else and this is the thing that worked. I could be wrong. Maybe I just don't know enough about YouTube to know why actually getting 10 million views is bad for you. Tyler typically does not defend himself when criticized, but instead tries to find some reason to discredit his critics. Anything from them getting a high salary to them thinking they do good in the world, which is bad to think. Tyler, if you're watching and want to discredit me, first of all, not necessary. I mean, look at me. Secondly, I, I once made a video where I justified shoplifting, so use that. Given what I have told you so far, would it surprise you to learn that Mr. Oliveira has, in fact, exaggerated in order to push a sensationalist narrative? That he got the most basic, fundamental facts about the situation in Vancouver wrong in every way? In addition to not being a country, Vancouver has not made every drug legal. Shocking, I know. That is not what someone in the journalism profession might call true. British Columbia, the province that Vancouver is within, also not a country, has decriminalized possession of less than 2.5 grams of specifically opioids, cocaine, MDMA, and methamphetamine. You may not distribute these drugs. You may not sell these drugs. They are not, in any sense, legal. They are not sold in stores. You cannot buy cocaine at Walmart. All that's happened, the big thing he's making this video about, is that from 2023 to 2026, Health Canada has granted adults in British Columbia a temporary exemption from criminal charges for possession of less than 2.5 grams of these drugs. It's still illegal, it's just that you won't be prosecuted for possession of small amounts for personal use under most circumstances, unless you're like, by a school or something. All of this information is available on the website for the province of British Columbia. It is the first Google result for drug decriminalization in BC. It's all pretty easy to find out. If, if, if you don't want to read a single web page, uh, they have condensed it into a one-page fact sheet which outlines all of this, and so it's not cryptic information, it's not something you need a law degree to understand, they, they kind of laid it all out in plain English for you to investigate, journalistically. So that's the lying he did in the title of his video. All of those inaccuracies are contained within nine words, six of which are lies. This is not a country, the law does not represent every drug, none of them are legal, and he certainly did not investigate any of this. This is Vancouver, Canada, a city that made every drug legal, drug addiction, overdoses, homelessness, and crime. Damn. Keep driving, drive, drive, drive. Again, Vancouver did not make every drug legal. We've covered the several discrete lies in that claim. Let's move on to some of his new lies. He claims that addiction, overdoses, homelessness, and crime are all side effects of decriminalization. And that's a pretty big claim to throw around without citing any evidence at any point throughout the entire video to support it. He's trusting that you'll take his word for it because he shows video footage with what we are to assume are examples of these problems. He walked around with a video camera and saw homeless people doing drugs, ergo, decriminalization has backfired. Obviously, many people in Vancouver are drug users, and ergo, tragically, they do overdose. There is also crime and homelessness in Vancouver as there is in any city. It's worth pointing out, neither Vancouver or British Columbia are like the worst places in Canada for any of this? The most drug use is in the prairies, for example. The most overdose deaths are in Toronto, because Toronto's the most populous city in Canada. And it's certainly not as though any of these problems began when BC decriminalized these drugs. Which I know, because they decriminalized these drugs in an effort to mitigate these exact problems. Once again, according to the website for British Columbia's page on the exemption, which I cannot stress enough, is the first Google result for drug decriminalization in British Columbia. The decriminalization of people who possess certain illegal drugs for personal use is a critical step in BC's fight against the toxic drug crisis. It will help reduce the barriers and stigma that prevent people from accessing life-saving supports and services. So, you know, it's not like they're just saying, eh, I don't know, it'll make the drugs safer somehow, like you're claiming here. The city's goal was to make using drugs safer by making them legal. If you're struggling with drug dependency, one thing that might prevent you from accessing life-saving support and services is the fear of getting arrested or already being in jail. Drug dependency is a disease, and it's a little fucked up, in my opinion, to arrest someone because they have a disease, or to put that another way. Substance use is a public health matter, not a criminal justice issue. Public health experts, police, and advocates have called for decriminalization, pointing to a range of potential benefits. Just to place all of this in context, BC is in the middle of what it calls the toxic drug crisis, which the province declared to be a public health emergency in 2016, and it has since claimed the lives of 13,000 people. So. A range of experts, including such soft-on-crime police-hating institutions as the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, advised the province to decriminalize certain drugs, and just pause to reflect on how bad a drug crisis needs to be 
before even the police are like, Ooh, maybe arresting people isn't working, uh... The city's goal was to make using drugs safer by making them legal. But many Canadians think it's done the exact opposite. Many Canadians think it's done the opposite. Okay, many Canadians think Tim Hortons coffee tastes good. That doesn't make it so. So on the one hand, we have a range of specifically public health experts saying one thing with data from other places that have made similar changes. And on the other, many people. Where are those people? Why do those people think it's bad. What do they have to say? Who knows? It's all just a matter of opinion. So we gotta get boots on the ground and see for ourselves. What does that prove? It's not as though he did a similar walkabout of downtown Vancouver before these measures went in place. Even if it were hell on earth now, how could he say for sure it wasn't even worse before decriminalization? I'm not a professional investigator, so far be it for me to act like I know better, but a supplemental approach I might suggest is looking at any information on the subject at all. Below are some tables from the BC Coroner Service for deaths due to illicit drug overdose. The yellow line represents Vancouver. Can you tell from these graphs when the exemption went in place, where law and order began to break down, and Vancouver became a haven for the damned? Right about here. Does that look like a big spike to you? Seems pretty consistent with the trend before the exemption to me. Overdoses have increased, of course as indeed they have every year since 2019. And if we exclude 2019, so too have they done every year since 2013. I guess decriminalization is just such a bad policy, it made the drugs go back in time and kill people 10 years ago. What about just general drug use? Well, that's harder to measure, but if we look at Health Canada's analyzed drug report from January to March 2023, where we would expect the largest increase in illicit drug use, if indeed the root cause were decriminalization, there was a 12% decrease in illicit drugs found in samples tested in BC, which might sound good, but it's much worse than the national figure, which showed a decrease of 23%. And we also saw a 19% increase in stimulant drugs, as opposed to the 7% increase nationally. Not great numbers, I'll admit. But also, seems kind of like that's just how the trend was going. Well, what about crime? Surely crime has gotten worse. Surely these real-life zombies are out there killing and eating people. The narcs over at Stay Safe Vancouver looked at police data, which reports that in the first quarter of 2023, again, where we would expect the greatest increase if, indeed, the root cause were decriminalization, assaults were down by 2.1%, robberies by 7%, thefts remained steady, home break-ins and auto break-ins were down, but alarmingly property crime was up 7%. So it's basically the purge. Because if there's one crime that I'm really scared of when I hear of high rates of drug use, it's vandalism. A quick note here, I'm not typically one to rely on information supplied to me by police as the police are demons, but generally it is in their best interest to, if anything, overrepresent crime. Their budget is contingent on there being a lot of crime, so they can say they need a lot of police and police toys to deal with it. Well, what about homelessness? According to the Metro Vancouver Point in Time count for 2023, homelessness has increased 32% since 2020, which was the last time this data was collected. And if you look at the data, it's, it's pretty consistent with the trend once again. But it needs to be said, this is the biggest upward jump between surveys since 2005. Perhaps, at least partially because, and younger viewers may not remember the year 2020, but there was this uh, huge fucking plague that destroyed the world economy. Of those surveyed, 24% of people attribute their homelessness specifically to substance use, which some of you math whizzes out there might note is not enough people to account for this dramatic uptick. I can find no evidence whatsoever of an appreciable spike in any of these statistics that is inconsistent with general trends. I've also gone out of my way to present these statistics in a greater context, even when that diminishes my argument. And what he's saying here is, and let's put this charitably, not demonstrated by the data. It's also pretty wild how easily he could have used this information selectively to paint a damning picture. All of the numbers have gotten worse. You could just say that and not mention the context, but he's too lazy to even do that. Like, literally the only time he shows any numbers or any data for any of this, he just cribs an infographic from CTV, and CTV was citing the coroner service report I already mentioned. This is what he calls investigative journalism. I should also point out I don't yet have access to a lot of data for 2023, so it's hypothetically possible that Tyler's baseless assertions might be proven correct in the future. But as of now, it sure seems like they won't. Uh, and either way, he doesn't have access to them either, so it's it's kind of irresponsible to just pull this out of your ass. 
we're 15 seconds into the video and we've already debunked its entire central premise with a few minutes of work, so I'm starting to question how thorough Tyler's investigation is going to be. So I went to downtown Vancouver with my friend Kevin, a social worker and drug addiction specialist, to see the impact decriminalizing drugs has had on the city. So this is Kevin Dahlgren. Dahlgren does not live in or work in Vancouver or British Columbia or Canada, for that matter. He works for the city of Gresham, Oregon, as a homeless services provider. Well, as of March, he no longer works for Gresham. We will return to why later. My point here is that he's not a local, which makes his inclusion in this documentary a little strange. Why not get a local social worker? Surely they'd have a more relevant perspective on the subject of Vancouver. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? And uh, you're just going to have to bear with me for a little while because we need to take a look at Kevin Dahlgren. This is the point in the video where it will become clear to you just how deep a rabbit hole I found myself within for this video? This is the part where things will begin to go off the rails. At first blush, Kevin comes across as a deeply compassionate person, eager to roll up his sleeves and make a difference in his community. You can find lots of videos of him giving money to people who need it, and a lot of videos of vulnerable people saying he was the first person who reached out to help. Videos, of course, that he uploaded on his uh, YouTube channel and his Twitter page. Uh, feels a little exploitative, but I'm, I, you know, I, maybe I'm just being too cynical. Because Kevin campaigns tirelessly against what he calls the homeless industrial complex, a confluence of civil, political, and commercial interests, which he believes throws money and resources at the problem of homelessness to line their own pockets without addressing it in any meaningful way. The homeless industrial complex has spent billions of dollars trying to solve a problem they do not understand. Most money in homeless services goes toward the housing first model citation needed. The idea is that by immediately giving a homeless person a roof over their head, meeting their basic needs, they are more likely to change. But this costly approach doesn't work. Since they are not required to change the behaviors that led them to and kept them on the streets, the success rate of the Housing First model is low. Citation needed. I don't know if being homeless is exactly conducive to proper mental health, Kevo. I do feel like, you know, if you're not, if you don't have shelter, it's kind of hard to do that deep work on yourself. But I don't know, what do I know? It's not like, you know, every time they ever just do a study where they give homeless people money directly, that seems to have an enormous success rate. Because that, if that were true, that would, that would contradict everything you're saying. And yeah, sure, yeah, no. Unhoused people deserve much more substantial help than they currently receive pretty much anywhere. I agree with you on that. But then he starts to lose me when he says stuff like, multiple homeless have said that the system is loving us to death. They hate the idea that they're being enabled. They may not say no to it, but they still don't like it. What they want is to be empowered. They want responsibility. They want accountability. Uh oh! If, if you've struggled with uh, homelessness, please let me know if I'm out of line here. But actually, I think the, the main thing they probably want is a home because that's a, a safe clean place to sleep and shower and use the bathroom and keep your stuff just an educated guess on that and i it just like i i don't know something something about the way he said homeless instead of homeless people that felt really strange to me as though he's going out of his way not to have to mention that they're people and that is not what you'd expect from someone who styles themselves as this compassionate defender of the downtrodden. And so I started to look into it, and it is something he does pretty consistently. Like, for example, in this report, he was contracted to create for the Deschutes County Sheriff's Office in Oregon. Throughout, he refers to unhoused people as simply homeless, even in sentences where that doesn't really make any sense. Of the times he refers to homeless people in this report, he uses just homeless, or the homeless, 17 times. He uses the words homeless man twice and homeless person once. But something else stuck out at me when I read this. The report also has a lot of rudimentary spelling and grammar errors, something I knew going in because a lot of the things I'd read about him brought that up. I wasn't prepared for, for just how ubiquitous and frankly baffling some of them were. I have started doing extensive mapping of Deschutes County with the goal in counting as many homeless as possible. And that's the first sentence of the report, by the way. The first sentence has a typo. For 12%, Tell report having contact with an outreach worker offering help with housing. I have spoke to 35 of them. I have spoke to 16 homeless. He got a job in Eugene where his family lives. 
the snow live with that family. At first, you might be wondering why I'm talking about the typos in some random report this guy wrote, which seems kind of petty, right? Seems like I'm grasping at straws here. But the thing is, he was paid. $18,750 of taxpayer money to create this report. A report, the first paragraph of which contains the sentence, when possible, I do an assessment and learn as much as possible, which is not only redundant, it also implies there are times where he does not do an assessment or learn as much as possible. I, like many Deschutes County officials, am a little confused about why this report was commissioned in the first place. The information he was contracted to collect was already recorded, much more thoroughly and professionally, by the 2023 Central Oregon Point in Time count. His information conflicts with theirs quite heavily, and I'm inclined to believe them, because you can watch an hour-long YouTube video where their methodology and results are meticulously outlined, they have copies of the forms they used, recordings of the training they gave to volunteers, all made freely available, whereas Dahlgren's methodology is a little less transparent. Because it, it seems to me like he was walking around and counting stuff by hand. It also seems like it was just him doing it, because at one point when talking about the Lapines area, he says, I have not mapped the areas with the highest concentration of homeless. They are in the deep woods, and am getting an escort there soon. I didn't do this on purpose, but like, literally every quote I pulled from this report, quotes that I had to cite for context, had at least one typo. I don't want to speculate, but it kind of feels like Dahlgren's report was commissioned in order to push a political narrative. There's a lot of him just half-remembering anecdotes and making some claims he doesn't even attempt to substantiate. Like, for example, the overall consensus with the homeless I've met so far, 63.8% of the homeless I've met came from outside the county. They came for a variety of reasons. Many have told me, me, they are here of the lax rules and the decriminalization of drugs. How many? How many told you, you, they are here of that? Who can say? I mean, you could say, but you don't. The last sentence of the report is also this curious little nugget. 7% of the homeless report addiction as the leading cause of their homelessness. I believe it is closer to 75% of all adults currently homeless in Deschutes County. That's what you do when you're paid $18,000 to do a survey is you just, you just guess. You just assume the data you got is off by a factor of 10 based on vibes. Are you starting to get the impression that maybe this guy has an interest in portraying homelessness as primarily the result of, of drug addiction? Are, are you getting the impression that maybe he, he's, he's willing to exaggerate to push that narrative based on him it's saying he's doing that here in his report? that he submitted for $18,000? There is a bizarre fixation in this report with whether or not the people, sorry, not the people, whether the homeless he's counting are from the same county, which might seem like just an academic interest or like at worst a weird little personal bugaboo, unless you're familiar with the ways that conservatives like to lie about homeless people. They love to pretend that homeless people just appear whenever a liberal government does liberal stuff. They move to wherever the libs make the conditions best for the homeless, like mosquitoes looking for poorly drained swimming pools. In reality, you will typically find a lot of people from other places among homeless populations because if you think about it for like a fucking second, you're more likely to become homeless somewhere where you have less of a support network, where you don't have family or old friends like one might in their hometown or place of origin. This man, who we are to believe is a homelessness expert, seems to think that homeless people have a disproportionately robust and up-to-date knowledge of city policy all across the country, which they used to migrate en masse to wherever the wacky libs get up to their old tricks again, as though homelessness is just the result of people deciding that the benefits of homelessness they receive thanks to government handouts outweigh the negatives. You see, according to Kevin, they're simply not motivated to get a home, because the city will give them food anyway, so why bother? Why would you need a home if you've already got a sandwich? Why not just stay homeless? It's so easy. Easy living. That's what homeless people are known for. I'm not editorializing, by the way, he literally claims homeless people have it too easy. He had a video on his YouTube channel go viral where he interviewed a woman named Wendy who had this to say. So how is it like being homeless in Portland? It's a piece of cake, really. I mean, that's why you probably got so many out here because 
They feed you three meals a day. You don't have to do shit but stay in your tent or party. Or if you smoke a lot of dope, you can do that. In a follow-up interview, Wendy said that she felt that this was framed inaccurately and that the video portrayed this as her personal experience rather than her anecdotal observation about others. And I find that telling, that even the people who agree with this narrative, the people that Kevin is using to launder this narrative, feel it is used to misrepresent the problem and dehumanize them. And it's all a sort of a contradiction, right? Because if he believes that unhumped people are not being adequately supported, and again, I agree, but also thinks that providing them with food or necessities creates dependency and stops them from becoming responsible, empowered, and accountable, whatever that means, accountable to whom, what's the solution then? What support do you think is needed? In Kevin's view, the best way to help unhoused people is to individually intervene one by one, solving personal problems in their life that prevent them from getting off the street. Each person is like a quest in a video game, a little puzzle where you get the right item or fulfill the right set of steps, and that fixes the problem forever. In his report, he lists what he calls success stories of people that he's helped in this way, something I don't feel like is in the mandate of that report. For example, the Santiago family, who he did a fundraiser to help get a new car part they needed to move on, like they're fucking ghosts, and he's solving their unfinished business so they can go to the other side. I'm not really sure why providing people with food creates dependency, but providing them with car parts wouldn't, but okay, that's certainly commendable. In, in general, I'm in favor of people getting their cars fixed. There are, however, some problems with this approach. For one, it's not really scalable, right? Like, it requires far too much time to be reasonably applied to each and every person who needs this kind of help. For another, I think there are a lot of people whose problems are going to run deeper than needing a car part and who will require some more sophisticated support than an individual social worker might be able to provide. And also, many social workers don't have big YouTube accounts they could use to solicit for donations. But worse than any of that, to me, it seems to put these people in a very vulnerable position where they're dependent on one person alone who could easily use this power to manipulate them, or worse. Now, nah. I don't say any of that to impugn Kevin Dahlgren's reputation or to diminish the good work he may have done in the past. But hypothetically, if I were interested in impugning his reputation and diminishing the good work he may have done in the past, I might point out Kevin Dahlgren is currently charged with seven counts of identity theft and five counts of official misconduct for, allegedly, stealing the identity of homeless people who came to him for help in his capacity as a homeless service provider. So, you know, that's not encouraging. Oh, also, the investigation into this alleged fraud started before he was contracted by the Deschutes County Sheriff's Office, so they just didn't look into him at all before deciding to hand him $18,000 so he could walk around, count RVs, and give them a PDF without spell-checking it. Also, hey, remember the Santiago family? The ones Kevin held a fundraiser for? Turns out, they didn't actually make it to the other side. Or Alaska, like he said in the report. And of the thousands of dollars Dahlgren claimed to have raised through solicitations on his YouTube page, they say they only received 900. And that's not fun. The fun has not been raised at all. So, all of this to say, this is the man that Tyler Oliveira brought on as his expert, the man whose credibility we are meant to lend to this video, a man who he invites along in a conspicuous amount of videos rather than speaking with, gee, I don't know, a local social worker. Seems, to put it mildly, a little bit shady. Of course, when they filmed this, Dahlgren had not yet been formally charged. We can't expect Tyler to know the future or to vet his sources, and when this was brought to his attention, he responded like I think any journalist would by calling the person who told him stupid and asking whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty. Uh, okay, so let's all just agree for the sake of argument that it would be impossible for Tyler to call up Dahlgren's employers and Gresham and ask why he'd been put on administrative leave. Let's pretend that's an unreasonable thing to expect from an investigative journalist. Let's also pretend that the phrase innocent until proven guilty is like a rule of etiquette instead of what it is a rule of impartial jurisprudence. Don't you think that once you discover that someone has been charged specifically with fraud, it might be a bad idea to present them to your audience of millions of people uncritically and specifically linked to the page where they solicit money without mentioning that fact? And if you want to support Kevin, go check out his YouTube channel at Truth on the Streets or help support his work directly and donate at truthonthestreets.org. Don't you think that might affect how your audience perceive him and his reputation? 
Don't you think they have a right to have that information before deciding whether to give him their money? And furthermore, let's just keep it tucked away in the old brain meat that Tyler believes so strongly and innocent until proven guilty. Just remember that fact in case, I don't know, he or Kevin repeatedly, baselessly accuse people, or indeed multiple people, of doing crimes. We're now 30 seconds into the video. I hope you're starting to understand the depth of bullshit we're dealing with here. Are smoking fentanyl, smoking crack out well, here. Yeah, it's Just the most, straight fentanyl, straight meth, straight crack everywhere. It, it's definitely the most concentrated group of people of any city you and I have ever visited. This is the meat of the video. Uh, they, they just walk around narrating their experience. They'll describe things that, that they're seeing that they don't actually film. He claims people are smoking fentanyl and crack everywhere, but neglects to like show that. And that's certainly not out of respect for the privacy of people he's filming, because he has no issue filming people without their knowledge or consent, as we will see. Nor can I find anything in YouTube's terms of service that would prevent them from showing this type of drug use unless specifically shown to glorify or promote its sale. So either they're exaggerating or they just didn't film any of the drug use that was happening everywhere just out of frame, trust me, bro. Because I guess they just, they didn't want their documentary to look interesting. You know, they were focused on the airy part. The document part? That they could take or leave. You will also notice a sort of gleefully amazed tone. They talk about how intense all of this is, how scary, all while seeming weirdly pleased about it. Kevin walks by an office building and says this. Yeah, we've only done one block, we've been out here for five minutes, it's just complete chaos. There's offices right here. Can you imagine working here full time? Kevin, you're a homeless services provider, or, you know, you were before the criminal charges. This shouldn't shock you. It's telling that we're not invited to sympathize with any of the drug users or homeless people, but instead, the people who have to work around them. Imagine working here and having to see this every day. Don't imagine living it. That but just imagine having to see it. Gross! Disclaimer cards claim that this is all for educational purposes and presented in a truthful, non-exploitative way. And that's always a good sign when you have to specify in a disclaimer that your footage is presented truthfully. Then, shortly after explaining how all of this is true and real, trust me, bro, he then claims uh, to have inhaled secondhand fentanyl, or maybe meth. I think are just on this street right here. Probably between 100 people. 100 people? Well, I appreciate you guys' time. I'm gonna move out of the way just a little bit. Um, yeah. hey, you think I inhaled fent meth just now? Yeah, uh, that's what it smelled like. I low-key think I inhaled some. <laughs> Did I do meth just now? Well, I'm feeling a little lightheaded. I'm, I'm not, I'm holding on to you for a well, reason. We don't see any smoke. We didn't see the person who supposedly is smoking it. And tee hee, look how funny it all is. Ha ha, hee hee. And this leads to, I think, the most incomprehensible sequence in the video where Tyler walks into a random convenience store and claims that seeing bongs and lighters is evidence of local businesses profiting off of the drug crisis. In hopes of escaping the fumes of meth I just inhaled, I walked into a nearby convenience store and noticed it was filled with pipes, bongs, torches, and every other tool a drug addict might need to fuel their drug addiction. He gets kicked out of the store, told he's not allowed to take pictures, but nonetheless records video anyway. A bit later, the store owner comes out and argues with him. He then claims to that man's face to have deleted all of the footage he took in the store, even though he obviously didn't. We just saw that footage. You lied to his face. Why are you selling torches? I didn't pay for the taxi. Okay, then what's the problem? I'm not saving the cash. Yeah, I'm we deleted everything. Just go, go walk away. Uh, which seems like something a, a journalist should not do and does call into question your personal honesty. He then claims to have caught him selling pipes and torches. He's pissed because we caught him selling pipes and torches in his convenience store capitalizing on the drug epidemic out here. I don't think a lot of hard drug users are going to be buying bongs shaped like Baby Yoda to smoke meth in the street, actually. I think those are for... We which is legal in Canada. Not like the way that you pretended all drugs are legal in Canada, but like actually legal. This is just a thing in cities. Convenience stores sell bongs and stuff because they're also where people go to buy snacks and soda and junk food and shit. There is a natural demographic overlap between the people looking to buy talkies at 3 a.m. and people who want a fancy bong, Tyler. I actually don't think that's the result of drug decriminalization because I can walk into most convenience stores in Toronto and find the same stuff, Tyler. You fucking square. And just, what, what do you mean you caught him? 
It, this isn't some back alley deal. This is a big wall of bongs. You didn't catch anything. He's not doing anything illegal or secret. He's not even doing anything unusual. And God damn, dude, it's a little rich for you, of all people, to claim someone else is capitalizing on the drug crisis. What the fuck are you doing right now with your little clickbait video? Most of my videos on serious issues like these get completely demonetized and we lose money making them. If you want to help us keep making important documentaries like these and get extended uncensored cuts, go subscribe to my Patreon for as low as five bucks a month. I literally just noticed while editing this of the videos he scrolls past, the only one to be completely demonetized, as he claims, is the one where he pretends that he's investigating whether or not Bush did 9-11, which I don't think qualifies as uh, a serious issue. So now it's time for some street interviews. He states that this guy initially supported harm reduction and decriminalization, phrasing which Tyler inserted into the conversation, not that man, which is something a journalist should not do. The man says it has not worked and has gone completely the wrong way, which is selectively cut to imply that decriminalization and harm reduction are themselves the wrong way. But in fact, the man goes on to say in a later clip that the problem is that they were not paired with support services like he thought they should have been, like he says has been shown to work in other places. Proper harm reduction has been shown in European places, you know, Switzerland. The whole argument is that they have institutions to rehabilitate these users and not just facilitate yeah, the well, drug that, use, that right? Too. That's one thing we've told him to disregard. Given that context, it actually doesn't seem like he changed his mind about these things when he saw the results. He was saying he disagreed with the implementation of the program because it didn't provide enough care. But Tyler selectively edits it to appear as though decriminalization has been such a disaster that even those who supported it now recognize the damage it's supposedly doing. Or take this clip. Yeah, I use it. I know a lot of people use it. Yeah. It's not really that dangerous if you're a user. You don't think decriminalization helps drug users overdose more often or anything like that? What kind of a fucking question is that, dog? Helps them overdose? And the man says no, by the way. He says that he doesn't think decriminalization would help drug users overdose. I don't think decriminalization helps drug users overdose more often or anything like that? I wouldn't think so, no. You seen people die out here? I have, yes. Yeah? Pretty common? This is pretty common. And it seems to me like this is a gotcha question. Oh, you say this won't help drug users overdose, and yet you yourself routinely see people die out here. Putting aside the fact that people can die of many things other than drug overdose, what a profoundly shitty way to treat an interview subject. To stick your nose so bluntly into some of the most traumatic experiences of their lives to, at best, gawk at them, and at worst, build a false narrative to contradict their lived experience because it conflicts with the picture you're trying to paint. Tyler then begins to talk about how Vancouver has also opened safe injection sites. He presents the arguments for them and then claims that Kevin snuck into one to see if they really lived up to what they were promising or if they were all just a, a haven for a drug crime. Little did I know, Kevin snuck into one last night and here's how it looked. It didn't seem clean, safe, or supervised from the little that Kevin saw. And that, admittedly, looks pretty bad. It's shocking. It does not look like a sterile medical environment. There don't appear to be medical professionals supervising. This is not how a safe injection site should look. And I've written here in my script, long pause for emphasis. Because as many Vancouver homeless and drug user advocates pointed out when this video was posted, this is not a safe injection site. It is a homeless shelter. You can see the fucking beds people are sleeping in. One thing you don't see is anywhere for people to inject drugs, safely or otherwise, which tends to happen a lot in safe injection sites. Here's what a safe injection site in Vancouver actually looks like, which I'm surprised you didn't know, Tyler, because you did use footage from this exact news report in this video to set up your false lying clip. So... One of two things is possible here. Either he willfully lied to his audience, or he was too lazy to double check the footage Kevin gave him, which, given the sloppiness of the work I've seen from Kevin in the past, you really ought to do. Quality journalism here, folks. 
Now it's time for some more street interviews and see if you can catch the extremely subtle way that Tyler leads this question. We saw a line waiting to go to the bank. Are they waiting for social welfare checks to, to buy more drugs or what? He saw a line to get into the bank, which he didn't film, and from this concludes, apropos of nothing, that people are waiting to get their social welfare checks. It's starting to feel like he's very subtly trying to inject a political message here. Here, like this security guy, would he do anything if you guys... No. Can they do anything? No. No. That's not what sec security cards don't... That isn't what security cards do. Then they talked to this guy who appeared to be a drug dealer guarding an alley. And then I found this guy guarding an alley entrance who appeared to be a drug dealer that agreed to an interview if we blurred his face. I don't feel like drug dealers typically like to be filmed. Even if you were to agree to blur their face, generally, drug dealers, as, as a category of person, tend to be pretty camera shy, actually. Which might go some of the way towards explaining why he appeared to be a drug dealer, rather than just saying, you know, he was, because... You can't prove that he was, because he probably wasn't. I pause now to ask, does it seem like Tyler is genuinely adhering to the principle of innocent until proven guilty? They go to a needle exchange to do some interviews, where they're told now is not a good time because they're dealing with an overdose. So instead of leaving, they hang around and film this man in crisis without his consent and talk about how wild it all is, how crazy it is. Meth overdose in real time right now, ambulance is probably coming for him. You look at Dana doing his thing. So, this is complete chaos. Yeah, and this is an active overdose in real time right there. We are completely surrounded by active users. Yeah. So firstly, yes, there tend to be a preponderance of drug users at needle exchanges. This is not unlike one might expect to be surrounded by hungry people at Olive Garden. I'm not sure if that represents a clear representative sample of the rest of the city. Secondly, no, you're clearly not surrounded by active users. You can see people walking by in the footage who do not appear to be on drugs, or indeed unusual in any way. You could just twirl the camera around, show us how surrounded you are. Is there a reason you don't want to do that? Is there a reason you're okay filming one guy having an overdose without doing anything to protect his privacy, but you're squeamish about showing us this dramatic image of how surrounded you are? Again, I must ask, do you simply not want your documentary to look exciting? Thirdly, and most importantly, Fuck you, because the man you're filming having an overdose, who, by the way, is a volunteer worker at the Overdose Prevention Society, actually helping other drug users in his community to reduce overdoses, the man you didn't bother to blur the face of as he was in active crisis waiting for an ambulance, did not give his consent to be filmed. I was filmed uh, without my consent, and it was posted uh, online, used in a negative way, and uh, it just feels horrible. They obviously caught me at my worst, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't want that to happen to other people. There should be some type of, uh, you know, I know it's uh, legal to kill people out in public, but at the same time, there's got to be some ethical boundaries. boundaries there. The other guy that they spoke to who said it wasn't a good time to talk shared similar sentiments. It was uh, a smear piece. Um, I was really disappointed, and I felt kind of used. I'm sure Tyler might argue that you're under no legal obligation to protect the privacy of people you record in public. And I'm not a lawyer, but I don't know if that's true. Seems like the jury's out, actually. But there is certainly an ethical obligation here. You didn't even hesitate for a fucking second before filming someone who did not only not consent to this, but also could not consent to it, and used it to present them as a sign of how dangerous the city had become. They just gawk at him as he's going through this horrible crisis and use it to paint people like him as dangerous. So I ask you, who do you think represents the bigger danger to this community? The guy who gives up his free time to specifically volunteer at the Overdose Prevention Society? Or the rubbernecking fake journalists spreading disinformation? The individual who has filmed without his consent is a long-standing community member who has saved countless lives from overdoses, as well as teaching others how to spot overdoses and reverse overdoses with naloxone. The fact that he was filmed at his worst and most vulnerable and posted for millions to see is unfortunate. We're halfway through the video, by the way. And I just want to stop and ask, so far, would you characterize what you've seen as truthful and non-exploitative? So then, this scene plays out. We walked off the block and into an alleyway. I noticed both ends were guarded by a drug dealer. Did you go through here? No. Yeah? Yeah, yeah they should worry about me now. Do you need anything, though? Oh, we're good. To my surprise, we had just been offered drugs on camera. He just assumes this random guy on a scooter is a drug dealer, based on 
Nothing. Whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty? He claims that this man is standing guard at an alleyway, which he clearly isn't, because, for one, he just lets them through when they ask, and also, this is not an alleyway, it's a bit of sidewalk that is covered because of construction. But, I guess alleyways sound scarier than sidewalks, so they call it an alleyway. When they ask him if they can cross, he looks really confused, like, what? Why, why are you asking me that? When Tyler speculates they might be heading into danger, you can hear Kevin saying, Yeah? Yeah, they should worry about me now, though. Anything, though? Hey, man. What does that mean? What do you mean by that? Are you gonna hurt people? Then Scooter Man says, You need anything, bro? Which they present as though this man has attempted to sell them drugs. And sure, maybe, he could be doing that, that's possible. But also, equally possible, is he could be just like, a confused and friendly person, asking if they needed something. In fact, I'm inclined to believe that is the case, because you had a camera and microphone pointed directly at him, so it kind of strains credulity that he would be offering you, a complete stranger, who might be a cop, drugs in that circumstance. Whatever happened to Innocent until proven guilty? He claims he walked past some active drug deals. My surprise, we had just been offered drugs on camera. Okay, we definitely just walked through some some active drug deals. I guess my main question about that is what the fuck are you talking about? Because no, you didn't. You imagined some guy you saw was a drug dealer and freaked yourself out. If those two guys you walked past were engaged in some sort of drug deal, you, you didn't specify that or show any evidence of it. As we walked away, we started getting dirty looks from those two dealers, but it was clear we could buy drugs on any corner of any block out here in East Hastings. Is that clear? That didn't seem clear to me from the footage you showed. Where are you drawing that conclusion from? Because one guy who you assumed was a drug dealer based on nothing says, you need anything, bro? That is your basis for the claim that it is clear that one can buy drugs on any corner of any street in the area. Do I have that right? Some real investigating going on there. We've now reached the part of the video that I like to call the Tim Pool Zone, where Tyler pretends that his investigation is getting too much attention, and now the criminal element is out to destroy him. Oh no, Tyler and Kevin are being followed. Yeah, we're definitely being followed right now. They don't show you, but you know, just take their word for it. Why would they lie? Did you use fentanyl? And the more we talk to people out here, the dirtier the looks we got. Something felt off. They're getting dirty looks? People off camera are pointing at them. There's three men to your left pointing at us and talking to them, and they're slowly walking over, so just be aware of that. Something's up. So, we gotta go. All right, let's go. And they're not gonna show you, but just trust them on that. Why would they lie? They're gonna die right now. They're in a dangerous situation here in the middle of a busy Canadian street in the middle of the day. He's got no back look. Sounds I'm good. trying to walk them. Yeah, everyone is eyeballing us. We're gonna get mugged down here. Yeah, they're looking at us right now. Maybe the reason people are looking at you is because you're filming them. They're probably wondering what you're filming. They walk past someone who mumbles something and it kind of sounds to them like, I'll fucking kill you. And they assume he was talking about them and trying to steal their camera for some reason. I legitimately think they try to take his camera. Oh, sh you because almost it sounds more to me like he's saying fucking video. The audio is very difficult to make out, but even if he is saying, I'll fucking kill you, I don't know if it's clear from the footage that he was speaking to anyone involved. It seems like a guy mumbling to himself. A and it seems to me like what he mumbled was fucking video because you're a bunch of poverty tourists filming a video. I could be wrong, but pointedly, the man did not try to kill you. So that seems to suggest he isn't the threat you're making him out to be. And you don't seem all that shaken up about it either, because just look at the delight on his face when he hears they have someone supposedly threatening them on video. When we walked by and he said, I'll kill you. Yep. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Not really the reaction one might expect from someone who's just been threatened. But of course, the army of scooter riding drug dealers wearing black masks are out to get them. What I've noticed is um, the drug dealers use scooters to get around here. I noticed that they so. always use scooters and they always have a, a mask on, usually a black mask. What the fuck are you talking about? Lots of people ride those fucking scooters. They're everywhere. How do you know those people are drug dealers? What are you basing that on? Whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty? I wonder if there's another reason someone might wear a mask. I wonder if there's a different explanation there. Gee whiz, I wonder. Maybe because of the fucking plague we're in the middle of. Maybe because it's fucking cold, actually. Based on when sundown happens in this video, it seems like it was filmed around late September, when it can get as low as 8 degrees Celsius or 46 degrees in loser points. So maybe it's cold, which is why everyone is wearing a jacket, including you yourself. Probably that guy right here. Yeah. Because they always have the black masks on.
fucking turned around when you said that shit. Well, I'm convinced. You pointed at a guy and called him a drug dealer to his face, innocent until proven guilty, by the way, and he turned around? That's drug dealer behavior. There's no other reason to look at someone when, when they point at you and speculate that you're a drug dealer for no reason. He was probably, at that moment, summoning some scooter men to assassinate you. I cannot stress enough how much of this video is just these two guys walking around pointing at things and pretending something sinister is happening. Walking up to people who are sleeping and bothering them and pretending like they're just concerned but of course felt the need to film it without their knowledge or consent of course. Guys wrapped in a trash can right here. I mean this scene is... I mean you can't, how do you breathe? Do we even know he's alive? Yeah, do you want to check in on him? He might need some Narcan or something, I mean. I was worried about you, you're in a trash bag. Okay, just check on your brother. You doing okay? All right, you take care, brother. Sir, are you okay? Just want to check on you. You okay, brother? Kevin's going to make sure they are alive. Okay? Are you okay, brother? Okay. He said yes. Walking by a lineup and assuming out of nowhere, they're once again looking to pick up welfare checks. Seemingly endless line of drug addicts still waiting to get government money from the bank to go buy drugs with. Walking by someone sleeping and assuming for no reason that they're dead. People appeared lifeless on the corner of every street, and it was impossible to tell if they were just high or dead. Kind of seems like you have a lot of problems with that distinction in general. They see another woman ODing, and of course, film that too. And then there are people there helping her, and Kevin just claims that they're robbing her? Well, it looks like she was overdosing, and as she is overdosing, they're robbing her. They're yeah. robbing her? Yes. Yeah, they're picking her pockets. That's crazy. Which does not seem true. But if it were, why didn't you do something to help? Kevin, I thought they had to be afraid of you, tough guy. Whatever happened to that? Then they filmed this guy take something out of someone's bag and, and throwing it away angrily. People were literally robbing each other in broad daylight out here. And then that person yells, <laughs> Which, to me, suggests that they know one another, and it wasn't so much a random robbery as they frame it here, but like, two people in conflict, innocent until proven guilty. Anyway, they get into a Zoom call with a member of the Legislative Assembly, which you can think of as vaguely analogous to a Canadian state senator, Eleanor Sturko from the BC United Party, a center-right conservative party, which perhaps confusingly was formerly known as the BC Liberals, but they meant it in the European economically liberal way, not in the liberal party way. She wants to undo decriminalization, which she claims failed because the city, once again, has not paired it with sufficient support services. What was the objective in decriminalizing those drugs? That their idea was that this would reduce stigma. They cite other countries in the world that have had some success with decriminalization. They talk about Portugal, mm -hmm. Uruguay, Germany, but there's a huge difference between what they're doing and what's being done here. Fortunately, the government is only telling half the story and they've only put half the work in because those other jurisdictions actually have involuntary care. Where the hell are they moving these people on to? It's just not fair for the public and it's not fair for people that have addictions. We need to provide them the services they need and make sure that they get the support they can to get well. What's the solution for all this? To make sure that actually police, for example, were given back their full discretion. We would see sure. decriminalization. It's like trying to bake the same pie as somebody else, but you don't use the same ingredients. It's not going to turn out the same. That's a, okay. Uh, so Decriminalization worked in other places because it was paired with these support and rehabilitation services. So what you want to do is recriminalize the drugs instead of providing those services. Um, and I guess, why? Like, if by your own admission, decriminalization and more support services work, why not do that then? Why don't you do the thing you think works instead of going back to a plan we know demonstrably does not? Regardless of, of how... Uh, utterly inane her talking points are, this interview looks pretty bad for Sturko. Given all of the controversies I've brought up, you'd think no politician would want to be seen working with this dickhole. And indeed, Sturko did not want to be seen working with this dickhole. She went on to claim that she didn't realize she was being recorded and did not give Oliver permission to use her interview footage. And I gotta take Tyler's side on this one, because uh, I find that a little hard to believe. You're clearly on a Zoom call, and when you're recorded in a Zoom call, a big notification comes up and tells you. So, like, seems pretty unlikely you'd miss that. Seems pretty unlikely that you'd agree to talk to a YouTuber without, you know, asking, hey, are you going to put this in your video? Tyler responded, calling her a spineless politician rather than defending himself, which, you know, seems to imply that, at the very least, he can't prove he did tell her that she'd be recorded. And here's a thought, my guy. If you're an investigative journalist, 
maybe have people sign some fucking release forms. Unless, for some reason, you feel that would compromise your production methods. The video ends with a plug for Kevin's YouTube channel and his website, where he solicits donations, and then instructions for a $500 giveaway if you post a clip from this video and tag him in it. Also, whoever has the most viewed TikTok or YouTube short using a clip from this video, I'll send you $500. Post however many times you want, but you must tag my TikTok slash YouTube at and put YouTube Tyler Oliveira in the title slash description. Last week's winner was this guy. Go study him. Good luck, guys. A lot of the winners seem to be bot accounts who exclusively post clips of Tyler's videos, which you really should not incentivize. Like, that's absolute scumbag shit. Like, it, it, not, not illegal. You know, not against any policies, just, you know, dog shit, awful way to promote yourself, oh my god. Before I got to this part of the video, I saw in Tyler's description a link to a Google Drive that he called the unedited footage. And I thought, oh great, I can look over the raw footage and see what he left out. Check his work. What a surprisingly transparent gesture. What a surprising show of integrity, I thought to myself out loud. And uh, it turns out, what he meant by the unedited footage was the edited footage, the exact video he had uploaded just without music. Full disclosure, I suppose I could have gotten access to a longer version of this video that perhaps contained some exculpatory evidence for some of the criticisms I've made here, but in order to do that, I'd need to pay him $5 on Patreon, and I would rather peel off my own skin than do that. Because I've written 24 pages about how manipulative, shady, and outright full of shit this one 14-minute video is. That's just cataloging all of the shitty practices, scandals, misrepresentations, and lies in one video. While writing this, I got a YouTube short served to me, that contained this line. What's the biggest problem out here in New Orleans? This is New Orleans. They're ignorant and don't give a fuck. They want everything for free. Because their great great grandfather was a slave. Do you think people would agree with you? Yes. What can you do about it? No. Tap here to see what he said. And I'm just, I'm terrified to look at that video because I, I don't know how much time I'm going to lose. He makes these once a week. Every single week. He has 5 million subscribers and his videos get millions of views. And that's before the legions of spam bots parodying his misinformation that he is incentivized are even factored into the equation. God only knows how many impressionable people have watched his bullshit and bought it wholesale. The comments are full to the brim of people who have. People who praise him for his journalistic integrity, his bravery for walking around on a sunny afternoon. A lot of these people express some pretty troubling views about homeless people and drug users, views that Tyler directly enforces and enables. Also, here's a huge bummer. There's a legitimate story here that with just the most bare bones effort, he could have covered fairly. There is a drug crisis in British Columbia, and it is taking people's lives in record numbers. That type of situation calls for clear-headed analysis, because the stakes, which are measured in human lives, are too high to be this cavalier about the truth. But he can't be bothered to check basic facts. He can't be bothered to title his video properly. And he feels entitled to not only stick his nose into a problem he hasn't done the slightest bit of due diligence to understand, but also to profit off of doing so. And that's clearly where his motivation is. That's clearly why he made all of the choices he made. The more sensationalized the story, the more outrageous the title, the more wild and crazy he can pretend the situation is, the more clicks he's gonna get, the more retention he's gonna keep, the more the money rolls in. He'll claim that he's showing people the realities of drug use, but, you know, if he's intending to show people reality, why did he lie so many times in the video? And if he's intentionally sensationalizing them because he thinks that the ends justify the means. One of the worst examples of public health communication in history was people trying this exact strategy and failing miserably. Sometimes he'll pay people he's talked to do some pittance, like five bucks or something, to be interviewed. And how many of them, do you think, have any idea that they're about to be seen by millions of people? How many do you think he followed up with to ask how they felt about the way he edited and presented their statements? And how many of them, do you think, even know they're being filmed for a YouTube video in the first place? I don't have a problem with people making videos about these subjects. I don't have a problem with people making money from videos about these subjects. But the way Tyler does so is deeply, fundamentally irresponsible. He calls himself an investigative journalist, but he, he's nothing of the sort. He is a profiteer of human misery, a poverty tourist, a parasite, who feeds off the attention he can wring out of people while they're in the throes of the worst moments of their lives. He is directly, measurably, making the world a worse place. A more ignorant place. A more cruel place. And I don't know what to do about it because he's not alone. You can find dozens of videos of people making this kind of hateful content. It's easy, as long as you're willing to lie, it's profitable. And the people being hurt 
have no resources to fight back if you misrepresent them. There's a growing cottage industry of frauds and hacks cobbling together dishonest videos to demonize the most vulnerable people in our communities. Truth be told, I took a deep dive on this video because I thought the title was funny. I didn't expect to find as much as I did, but I could have done the same for hundreds of others. Even the way he is shitty is thoroughly unremarkable. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, thank you for watching. I know that this one was a lot longer than you might be accustomed to from me and definitely a lot more serious, but you know, given the subject matter, it, it felt like I had to put in some, some extra elbow grease on this one. I felt like I owed it to the people that he was misrepresenting. In any case, thank you so much for your continued support throughout 2023. It has been a year. It's definitely been one of the years, and I hope that everyone watching this has a safe and happy new year, unless Tyler Oliveira is watching, in which case I hope everyone but one person who is watching this as a safe and happy new year.